Greetings to you all remotely. And I just want to begin by expressing my appreciation for Kate and uh, what you are doing with APPPAH. Um, I think uh, really this is a, a terrific initiative and the beginning of uh, great things. And I'm just very pleased to uh, be able to support. And um, so full speed ahead for Kate White and for the organization uh, APA. I'd like to begin. Uh, my practice today will be to um, talk around particular slides that you see in front of you. So. The first slide is a uh, artwork which is known as the Flammarion woodcut. It's from the 1800s, an astronomy magazine in Paris, France, uh, ran the original, and then it was colorized in the 1960s. And um, I love this picture. And to me, it uh, suggests the uh, two major aspects of what I'd like to do today. We see the pilgrim or the shepherd or whoever he is uh, lifting the veil of the horizon, the normal world, and peeking into another dimension, uh, so-called the invisible world. And in the normal world, it's nature as we know it, the landscape, the stars, and the sun, and the moon. And in the invisible world, the other dimension, it's uh, a fabulous realm of a wheel within a wheel, which to me suggests Ezekiel and the stories of uh, conceptual transcendence and seeing other realities. And um, to me, what we're doing here is we're, um, first of all, we're hoping to lift the curtain on the invisible world in terms of seeing beyond a mechanistic view of people in general, of um, society and how it operates, and in particularly, uh, particularly with babies, that if we could recognize babies for who they really are and treat them with the respect the sacred uh, is very much present. Uh, I think people who work with babies and newborns and the birthing process, including the moms and dads, uh, feel this intuitively, but it's not um, embraced in a more spoken way. And I think many babies come into the world and feel unrecognized for who they really are. So this picture to me suggests that uh, we could perhaps lift that curtain, see into the invisible world, really change how we approach the whole experience of babies and birthing. And I think the lifting of the curtain and seeing a new reality could be interpreted in terms of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is clearly the basis, the foundation for our health. However, most are unable to really name the anatomical parts of it. Um, they're unable to, when they are able to speak about it, they actually have 100-year-old information that has not been updated. And uh, the work of Stephen Porges is like shining a light into a dark room, which has the effect of elevating the autonomic nervous system into the foreground of our awareness. So I foresee a time when with babies and newborns and the birthing process, the, the highest priority will be protecting the autonomic nervous system. And the reality is that that's the trump card of our wellness. That's the, uh, the basis. And it, so we're overturning, we're, we're, we're changing the primary mainstream view 
of what's most important to uh, support the baby's wellness and our wellness throughout life. So then we would just take a moment here. I'm turning the page, giving you an image of who the baby really is. We can uh, take advantage of resources such as the book Journey of Souls or Gary Schwartz's work at University of Arizona. We could uh, take advantage of these to confirm and validate the ideas of Randolph who tells us that the baby is really a visitor from an invisible world coming to this world for a noble, sacred purpose and deserves to be recognized and treated on that basis. And the, the purpose, as articulated by Stone, was the fulfillment of consciousness. That the baby is here with a, uh, the particular parents in a particular time to learn particular lessons to gain wisdom and understanding. And this is the most elevated of purposes, and we could really see babies in that light. And I like to think we could approach the baby, and maybe we have to do this non-verbally because it's not politically correct for some parents or some doctors or whatever, but even non-verbally I have found that it works if we can really appreciate who the baby is, then the work will go deeper. And the babies will see that they are recognized. And the contrast to that is the prevailing norm. And we see a picture of Virginia Apgar, who developed the Apgar test. And we see she is holding the baby upside down and uh, this is thought to help drain the lungs or something and to uh, create a strong first breath or whatever the rationale was. But we're looking at an image of a state of mind on the part of the caregiver. And there's no question, Virginia Apgar was an intelligent, very well-meaning person. But she lived in a culture where this type of action was acceptable. And this, to me, is recognizing, is the lack of recognition. You know, naturally, if we had a royal visitor from a faraway place coming to see us and to honor us with their presence, we would not uh, do uh, actions such as this. We, this would be unthinkable. And so, back to our original picture, I'm hoping to lift the veil into a new reality in which this mentality that Nurse Abkar is uh, demonstrating here, that um, this mentality really uh, goes the way of other obsolete ideas and practices. So we could continue a little further. I'd like to give some credit to some particular people who had a big influence on my thinking. And you can see Robert Fulford was the uh, legendary osteopath whose books are very inspiring. And then, um, in particular, Franklin Sills has had a big influence. And most of all, I would recommend, if you have not yet um, had interactions with Ray Castellino, and um, that to me has been really a guiding light now for two decades. Um, I also really appreciated the effort uh, that took place with the Santa Barbara Graduate Institute. I would like to give you one slide, just giving, trying to summarize a four-day seminar that I teach every year. Uh, this year it's on the East Coast in Washington, D.C. Um, this uh, seminar that I teach is, uh, this is kind of a, hopefully giving an idea of what's involved. 
and the idea of how we might approach a session for uh, a newborn or a very young baby. And uh, you can see the different aspects of it. It, it involves some uh, cranial sacral therapy and some polarity therapy in terms of counseling and some guiding principles and some daily day-by-day -day, uh, topics that we attempt to cover. Then I've given you two pages for some of the feedback that I've received from some of my clients. And on this one I have on the right, you can see there's numbered some of the main points that I try to cover because that particular uh, letter that I received from the mom really touches on some of the main uh, themes of the approach. And then some other uh, letters as well you can see on the left. And then on the next page, uh, a most unusual case, they only had one session and uh, seemed to be a very good uh, outcome, uh, as it says, turning from a grumpy little newborn to a happy, smiley, three-month-old. So um, I'm just wanting to, um, you know, give you a sense of, uh, you know, where I'm coming from with this. And uh, I would say my own uh, passion for working with babies really derives from my own childhood. I was about... Uh, six years old when my first of two younger siblings were born, so I was in a perfect age to really appreciate the magic that they represented and to um, uh, enjoy the caregiving activities. Um, I just really took to that. Uh, it made a big impression. And then when my own children came along, I just derived enormous pleasure from... Uh, all the all the parenting experiences. So then, this uh, brings us to our sort of main topic of the first part of the presentation. So uh, Stephen Porges, here is his picture and his main statement quoted from his book, and uh, I know the term polyvagal throws some people off. And uh, so I'd like to just take a moment to explain that. Poly means men, many, and vagal refers to the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. And the discovery 20 years ago or so is that the four nuclei of the vagus nerve, one is non-conforming to the regular definition of parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is one branch of the autonomic nervous system, which we'll discuss a lot in a minute. And the, uh, the discovery that this one uh, nuclei, nucleus connection, which innervates the face, neck, throat, and to some degree the heart, is not parasympathetic by technical definition. Technical definition has to do with the absence of myelin sheathing and the distance of the ganglion from the target organ and other um, you know, technical requirements. This one is it's non-conforming, and that attracted Porges' attention as an anatomical anomaly. And he discovered that actually this other branch, which is bound in there with the vagus, actually is uh, doing something else. It's separate. And he dug into that, as we will discover just shortly, and that led to the polyvagal theory, many vaguses with um, a much more sophisticated understanding of the autonomic nervous system. So his main statement is three neural circuits form a hierarchy. So this is overturning the 100-year-old 
understanding of autonomic nervous system, which holds that there are two neural circuits, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And the conventional view is that the two circuits are mainly reciprocal in their action. One goes on and the other goes off. And they're known by the terms fight and flight for sympathetic and rest and rebuild or something like that for parasympathetic. And here, Porges says, no, actually there's three circuits. The third one is being called the social nervous system and that they're in a hierarchy, <clears throat> like a cascade. A newest one is the social, which is present in mammals and especially primates, and then an older one, which is present in vertebrates, the sympathetic, and then the oldest one, parasympathetic, is present in all uh, animals in some form. Every creature has some form of digestion and respiration and baseline metabolism. So three neural circuits form a hierarchy. That's the message of polyvagal. And we could, um, I offer to you that this is a revolution. This is absolutely a revolution in understanding that has transformative possibilities for uh, therapies of all kinds, for uh, their, um, education, early childhood environments, uh, social structures, and um, just the way we operate in the world. If we can really understand this, it will take us uh, to very rich territory. We have to appreciate that the autonomic nervous system is the foundation of health, I, no less. 80% or more of all health conditions are autonomic nervous system events, including degenerative disease, um, immune system function, uh, psychological and behavioral issues, and um, even things like uh, allergies and being accident prone. Uh, over and over again, the autonomic nervous system is the key player. So if we could really understand the autonomic nervous system and protect it, first and foremost, we will find fantastic benefits uh, in all different fields of action in life. And I have some um, pictures to sort of uh, prove this to you, just anecdotally. And the first one is called the rescuing hug. Perhaps you've seen it. In the rescuing hug, uh, newborn twin girls, uh, one was flourishing and the other was not, was fading. And the nurse had the intuitive insight to put them back together in one bassinet. And uh, when they were together, the stronger one threw her arm over the weaker one, and the smaller baby's heart rate stabilized and her temperature rose to normal. So we had a, an outcome created by this strategy, and we are immediately curious what exactly was the physiology of the change, the correction. Why did that baby get well? Because this is something that there are no technologies or medical strategies that could have accomplished. The baby's too young for normal types of treatment. Another example is the um, program called Roots of Empathy. In the Roots of Empathy program started in Alberta, the uh, government pays new moms to bring their very young children into classrooms, and they just sit there. And it's been discovered that in the presence of babies, all the children change their neurochemistry. They change their behavior. And you can see this in the picture with the intent gaze of the children looking at the baby. The, um, 
something changes. We are hardwired. This is automatic. There's no instructions given. There's no coaching. The baby just comes in and just sits there, and the children uh, change very beneficially. Oxytocin, vasopressin, and the neurochemistry of wellness starts to flood the system. And you can see the research projects that have been generated to document the benefits from the program. And the list is fantastic. Emotional literacy, neuroscience interest, temperament, curriculum, connection, participatory democracy, um, violence pre prevention, perspective taken, uh, taking, even prevention of teen pregnancy, attachment, male nurturance, inclusion, infant safety, all of these arise naturally from the inside of the students when they're exposed to a new baby, a young child. This is a very strong confirmation of the validity of Porges' uh, discovery. And then one more, which is the effectiveness of therapy dogs. It's been well established that um, the companionship of a docile, friendly pet has many, many autonomic benefits. Uh, for instance, uh, children who are learning to read uh, gain tremendously. Um, you know, if they just are lying next to or on top of a friendly dog, and it's been well proven with seniors and people recovering from surgery that when they're uh, given the contact, it's activating their social engagement system, and that's a trump card for the autonomic nervous system, floods down, cascades down into sympathetic and parasympathetic, and people get better from a host of different conditions. The word phylogeny throws people off a bit. Perhaps you were one of the ones who in sixth grade or eighth grade biology class or high school were tortured with the phrase ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which is actually not correct. Um, hilarious to think the amount of effort that has gone into that. But what that means what phylogeny means is the evolutionary development and history of a species. That is, all creatures have uh, various, uh, you know, some form of digestion, but it gets more and more sophisticated as we descend into the more later developments. And Porges worked this out, how the autonomic nervous system, one of its most important functions, is the heart regulation, and he shows us how there's an up arrow in very primitive, and then a down arrow, that means quieting, and then there's another up arrow, that means stimulating, and then there's another down arrow. And what this is creating is a waveform, an up, like a sine wave, an up activation and a down rest, and that creates a window between the top and the bottom of the wave, a window of functionality. And that window expands greatly as creatures get more and more sophisticated between amphibians, reptiles, mammals, continuing to get more and more sophisticated. And there's a lot we could do with this. For example, if we could learn how to protect our clients, especially our babies, from going through the roof at the high end or falling off the, off the bottom trough, the low level, then we would have a clear anatomical understanding of how to avoid anxiety and depression which are autonomic nervous system events of great significance, as you all know.
before I leave this slide, which I recommend you really get this. I put this on a poster, by the way. You can get the poster, and that helps you kind of graze on it. Uh, you don't have to take this in all at once, but it really has tremendous meaning. Um, one other small point is you notice the red star under the dorsal motor nucleus and the nucleus ambiguous. This is the so-called dorsal vagal and the ventral vagal are two separate events in terms of phylogeny. And they both are downward pointing. They're both quieting the heart. So it's sometimes confused. And please, let's, uh, as we get into this, let's get this distinction that the dorsal motor nucleus is not the same phylogeny as the nucleus ambiguous. They do coincide in space, but they are really different. They're both slowing the heart, but they're actually quite distinct. His, uh, his message is that there are three branches, and we need to get to know them. We need to know what they do and how to recognize them. And in particular, we need to recognize that they're hierarchical, that social engagement has the power to override and regulate sympathetic, and sympathetic in turn has the power to override and regulate parasympathetic. So that's where we're going. With this particular slide, I recommend that, again, it's on the poster. It's in the chapter that's online. It's uh, something you could spend some time with and um, you know, really soak it up. I think these topics are um, transformative if we spend some time to really um, absorb them. So with the triune, that's three-part autonomic nervous system, it's useful to gain understanding of the uh, anatomy of it. I'm a touch therapy background, and I think having a ground in anatomy really strengthens the work. For instance, you could go into an institutional setting and you could be saying, you know, I think we want to elevate the autonomic nervous system to the top position in terms of what we take care of during this procedure. And if the institutional authorities are not able to relate to the concept, you could say, you know, there actually is an anatomy for this. And then now some of that sort of mechanistic science can be invoked to gain a little credibility and to strengthen our case. The goal is to keep that blue anatomy in its full range of motion, its full functioning. And there's a lot to talk about with that. But I'd like you to put it on your list of things to do that you'll start to be, you know, let that anatomical part be an aspect of how you approach, how you hold this whole uh, polyvagal theory. Then we turn the page here to differentiating normal ANS functions from stress responses. Uh, to me, this is maybe the most important clinically. And first of all, I'd like to say that you know we have to recognize that the conventional understanding of autonomic has a fundamental error. Because if I ask in a large room of students or uh, you know a conference, if I say, OK, turn to your next door neighbor in your seat there and tell them what is the autonomic nervous system, most people will say fight or flight versus rest and rebuild. And that is mixing the normal function, which is rest and rebuild, with a stress response, fight or flight. It's apples and oranges. And it's a real problem because it tends to give sympathetic a bad rap. It tends to, uh, you know, in touch therapy, it's been said the objective of the therapy is to restore parasympathetic states, rest and rebuild. But in terms of stress response, that's the wrong thing. We actually don't want to do that. 
if they are in a parasympathetic stress response, that's going to be worse for the client, not better. And people don't understand that yet. This is a, a message that needs to be uh, explored. So in this chart, we see the normal functions. And I'd like you to, again, um, take it as a objective. Again, this is on the poster. It's in the book. Um, the poster is maybe a little better because it's in color. Or you could just get the slides and print it in color. And really let your eyes uh, graze on these different uh, concepts, these different functions that exist as normal functions. Basically, parasympathetic is our baseline metabolism, things we don't have to think about, heart, breath, digestion, etc. Sympathetic is daytime mobilization. And social is interconnection with people. And it originates in the need for the baby to be protected. Uh, many other vertebrates uh, are born, and they're pretty functional within minutes, hours, or in some cases, maybe a day or two. They're actually pretty functional, if you've uh, seen the birth of other vertebrates. But babies with their massive cortex need much longer time of protection. And it needs to be not left to chance. It needs to be hardwired for survival. So nature endowed us with the third branch of the autonomic nervous system to take care of that, the social engagement system. Baby comes out. And there's a dance of communication between the mom and the baby. There's cooing and eye contact and sounds and touch and, uh, you know, uh, caressing. These are all stimulating, both for mom and for baby, the neurochemistry of the social nervous system, oxytocin in particular. The mom loves the baby. And love, in this sense, is a biochemical event created to secure her loyalty for a very long time. And that's what's necessary so that the child can mature. And it takes the brain a long time to mature. For example, the risk assessment area in the brain, for most people, it's about 23 years. And I was very pleased to see Dan Siegel, Rick Hansen, starting to uh, really emphasize this, Bessel van der Kolk as well, really emphasizing that we need to understand what's going on in the teenage brain a lot better in order to give them the support that they need. Because we're, uh, you know, we easily draft or put them behind the wheel of a car or give them certain privileges but their risk assessment area isn't actually on board yet. And they need certain kinds of support just based on neuroscience. So later in life, this same neurochemistry serves as our medium of communication. And it, of course, there's part of it that's cognitive. But here we're talking about the automatic part. So for example, if I make a loud noise in a room, then everyone will do the same thing, regardless of age or gender or role in life or culture or education or any other variable. If I make a loud noise in the room, everyone will do the startle and orient from the sympathetic, but almost immediately they'll make eye contact and they'll say, what was that? Did you hear that? And that part was automatic. It was not trained or learned in any way. It's the social engagement part of the system kicking in, which it does naturally. That's getting into the stress responses, which we'll talk about a little further. Um, but here I wanted to also uh, point out the work. Um, let's see. Paul Ekman deserves some credit. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with his work. And maybe you saw the TV show Lie to Me, 
which uh, the first three episodes is fantastic. You can see them on Netflix. Um, how the voluntary and involuntary functions do overlap significantly, but the involuntary are immediate and universal and cannot be fully controlled. The truth wizards, you could look that up in Wikipedia, the truth wizards are discovering how the involuntary, the social signaling, is automatic, not cognitive, and incapable of inauthenticity or deception. A very interesting area and very useful with our clients because we can walk in, it only takes 10 or 20 seconds to assess which branch of the autonomic nervous system are in the foreground for the, uh, any particular client. And once we know what branch they are based on, then we can derive a strategy for how to greet them where they are and start the process of restoring full range of motion, which is really the holy grail of therapy, in my opinion, for babies or for adults. So we turn the page now to stress responses. And here we see the same three steps, the same three colors. It's still a cascade going from the new at the top to the older to the oldest. And now we see what happens automatically under stress. And we see many interesting features here. The best known of these is sympathetic. The social and the parasympathetic here is being detailed in this way. Uh, you know, this is new. And this has been vetted by Porges, so it's not just uh, flying in the wind here. Um, these are the stress responses. This is where we really want to uh, pay attention because that's our clients are what our clients are dealing with. And um, we notice some interesting thing, things here. Once, uh, one is that Peter Levine has told us that there are secret doorways from each branch to the other branches. And that makes an interesting uh, thing to track in therapy sessions. And then the, um, the hierarchical part is very important here that in the presence of novelty or threat, we'll try our newest, best strategy first. That's the social. If that doesn't work or has not worked in the past, we'll try our older strategy, the sympathetic. And if that does not work, then we'll try our last. And the parasympathetic, which is immobilization, shock, dissociation, depression. I think uh, Robert Scare has done a good job of really highlighting how uh, rescuing our clients from parasympathetic is really the top priority in trauma therapies. Um, we have to realize that babies actually go through this pretty quick. That is, they will try their social strategies, but we suffer in our culture from infant quarantine. Perhaps you're familiar, in the 1880s, following the discoveries of Pasteur and Lister and Semmelweis, the um, uh, hygiene mandate or imperative came to the foreground and infant quarantine was uh, developed, which is take the baby away from the mom as soon as possible, put the baby in a nursery where it can be a sterile environment, and avoid, avoid infection. And in fact, that did have many benefits, but it was not known what that would do uh, behaviorally. And it's a disaster behaviorally, because the baby... It's a stressful event being born, and naturally they play their blue card first. They try to make contact, but we whisk them away and put them in a nursery instead of skin-to-skin -skin contact with mom where they should be. And then they might briefly try sympathetic, but really young people don't have much to offer. They, they don't have many resources for sympathetic. They're too small. Their muscles aren't developed. They can't flee. Their 
they're dependent, they can't fight, they would be overpowered. So the baby might have an angry cry for a short time, but rather quickly they'll go into immobility and dissociation. And I see this all the time. That is, you come in uh, to give the baby a session and it's a vacant. They don't make eye contact. And they're very quiet, so they're called good babies. But autonomically, it's not so good. We're looking for the full range of motion in the autonomic nervous system as the foundation of lifelong wellness. So the game plan is very much about restoring. You invoke the social. If you can get the social going, it's like a trump card, and it'll just the dominoes will fall into place. It'll just cascade through the system, and there will be a very good recovery. And I've seen over and over, uh, the mom will say the next day, I'll get an email, and they say, wow, I have a whole new baby. You know, a totally different quality of interaction. It's important to realize with all this the osteopathic principle that the health is never lost. I think the pre and perinatal world suffers a little bit from feeling like, oh, well, I didn't get that. You know, I had a, a conventional birth or there were interventions, it was a medical emergency or whatever happened. I had uh, various interventions. Um, and we can sort of develop kind of a doomsday thinking around that, that, oh, woe is me, you know, uh, my life is ruined from the first 20 minutes of my, after my uh, emergence. And in the osteopathy, the first principle is that the health is never lost. Um, the neurology and the neurochemistry of wellness of a complete functioning autonomic nervous system doesn't just shrivel up, dry up, and go away. It's there, just maybe somewhat dormant, waiting to be uh, redeveloped. So in my view, it's all about working with our clients, including babies, really working in the present. The healing happens in the present. Of course, there's an interest in excavating all the bad things that happen and sorting them out. But let's do that with an air of optimism because the, the health is never lost. The social is still there, sympathetic, even in severe cases, uh, you know, criminals. I think Alice Miller did a good job showing how uh, the perpetrators were victims in their childhood. The ACE studies, the largest psychology study of all time, as far as I know, uh, really brought that out. Um, Everyone is here for a purpose, the fulfillment of consciousness, and there have been some obstacles, but it doesn't just go away. It's always there, easily accessible, and it's a, just a delightful moment when you see the baby, the newborn, kind of snap back in to full range of motion of their autonomic nervous system. And the, the benefits are lifelong. It's not just uh, a momentary. This will last. It really does uh, take hold and continue, um, you know, if we can organize around that for support. Uh, I've given you some slides that I won't um, dwell on, but um, I recently did a seminar with Diane Heller, who's an expert in attachment therapy. So I thought some of these might be of interest. Um, Diane and others make the point that developmental trauma is worse than event trauma and really deserves a higher place in the therapeutic uh, agenda. Developmental is uh, things that happened with the autonomic nervous system especially betrayal of any kind. Um, social gets defeated, sympathetic gets tried, maybe we stay there a long time as adults and we're aggressive or violent people, or it turns eventually to parasympathetic and we find dissociative, immobilized behavior and depression. So 
Um, healing attachment wounds really deserves attention. And when the new baby comes along, it's pretty likely that some of the parents' childhood experiences are going to be uh, kicking in. And so I think we can keep a supportive eye out for that and help the parents uh, maintain their equilibrium, um, you know, in a complex uh, sequence. And then I'd like to spend some time remaining here with the body low, slow loop practice. This has been very, very helpful, and I recommend try it out for yourself and give it to your clients, get their feedback. Um, this could really help you. It's free. It's self-regulating. The people do it for themselves. It works like a charm, and I've had excellent results. So body low, slow loop is an attempt to capture in the fewest words, the fewest syllables, even the fewest letters, the core concept offered to us by Peter Levine. And body low, slow loop means, please direct your attention into the body first and notice whatever is present. And in the absence of anything else, there will be gravity and breath at least. If we don't have gravity and breath, we really have a problem. <laughs> then we go to low, that is within the sensations that we're noticing, try to figure out the lower border. For instance, right now I've been talking a lot. I feel a lot of sensation in my throat. It goes down how far? Well, I'd say to my collarbone area. And then slow means ask about the details. And that means things like, is it more on the left or the right? Is it moving or still? Is it shallow or deep? These kinds of questions, when you pose these to your clients, they will uh, Cause, it will cause them to pause. You can see they get a thoughtful look on their face, and they go, oh, let's see, left or right? I think more on the left. It causes the awareness to slow down. And then loop is the magical part of it. This is Peter Levine's great innovation. He would have used the word pendulation here. But if that didn't fit. And to say pendulation didn't have the nice rhythm of body low, slow, loop. Body low, slow, pendulate. No, it doesn't sound as nice. So we substituted loop. And when you loop, you take the attention somewhere else for the same amount of time as you were doing the first three and ask all the same questions. What sensations are present? What, uh, what's the lowest border? Can I slow it down with detailed questions? And the feet and the fingertips are optimum for this because they are programmed in the autonomic nervous system as being less mission critical. If we are attacked by someone, we'll offer them our feet or our hands because we autonomically know if we get a nick on our hands or our feet, it's not going to be uh, life-threatening, whereas the torso is different. And uh, with some clients, if they're just getting started with this, I have them wiggle their toes against the carpet or the floor to sort of create a louder sensory nerve signaling coming from this second location in the body. So then you come back to the first place, and it's very likely the first place now has changed. And that's the key. That means that we're now in the autonomic nervous system, and it's reconfiguring, coming back into balance with just a 10-minute practice that a person can do rather readily. And the best, uh, I think, is to learn how to do this and teach your clients to do it when they don't need it. That is, just in their everyday life, so that it will be there for them when they do need it. 
for instance, if they're in a car accident or if they have an upsetting sequence of events during a birth or something like that, they could learn body low, so loop, learn how to do this, and it will drain some of the charge from the system. This can be, uh, you can download a podcast. There are three versions of it, one for teachers, one for students, one for patients. Um, on our website, these are free. They take about 12 or 13 minutes. It's my voice talking you through a guided visualization of doing body low, slow loop. And then you can have your clients listen to that a few times until they internalize it. Now they know how to do it for themselves, and it will come in very handy for autonomic nervous system support. I've had excellent results with this. And just last week with the Diane Heller group, I got an uh, email from a lady. She's in Norway. She's doing this with all her clients, and she's having spectacular results. Um, it's, it's working very well, so I just recommend it so highly. So then now some more slides that are included in the collection and invite you to uh, rummage through those in your own time. And uh, <clears throat> I'm offering you the resonance practice. These are all from Chapter 9 of Dancing with Yin and Yang. Uh, this one is excellent for um, healing attachment systems, the social nervous system, by uh, inducing pendulation from self to other and back, which is a cornerstone of attachment therapy uh, theory. Then I also offer you the boundary practice. It's also in Chapter 9. This is very helpful. And in my opinion, most people with developmental wounds also have boundary problems. This can really help. It's something a person can do on their own to gradually restore a healthy protective shield around themselves. And I gave you a page on the two-chair method. That might be of interest for you. Uh, to get the applications with babies is one of the main things I do when there's uh, problems with the babies. I love to try to support with getting the mom to talk to the baby. And the baby has the wisdom to supply the correction that's needed. A couple more slides. This one is my main theme, is that principles of physics and chemistry can be applied to psychology. There's an opportunity to unify science in this way. And um, we take this dualistic arrangement that we find everywhere in nature and transpose that into the physical body as offered to us by Dr. Randolph Stone in 1948. One pattern prevails in the body, the mind, and the spirit, positive and negative and neutral, interacting together. It applies in relationships. It's happening with husband and wife sperm and egg, it's omnipresent and a key to understanding what's really going on.